The reason I think that shamanism is so important is because I think what it really boils down to is a revaluing of personal identity. And that when you strip away the feathers and the chants and all the anthropological uh, gimcrackery that goes along with it, what makes it so compelling and so attractive is that it is a more authentic state of being, somehow. Now why? Just see, everything is shadow and light, you know, and that's it, you know, there's yin and yang in everybody. And it's some people are more than the other. You know, it's, and it's about finding that healthy, balanced relationship between both sides that you can balance. It's like the masculine and the feminine side of both of us. It's about balancing the two of those. It's about balancing the subconscious and the conscious mind and the dreams. They're all together. That you're walking in that particular way that keeps them in balance. And the shadow is there in everybody, and it's in this world because this is an imperfect world. It's supposed to be that way. And our job is to come here, those who have insight and um, hold space for people who need to get through it. And it's not about fixing it, it's about helping people to find their own way. It's not about come and do my workshops and my training and this is the way it has to be done. It's the, you, you want to get away from all that. It's about people learning to become spontaneous again and listen to their intuition and their own higher self and be guided by that and not by a teacher or by an ism or by an organisation or a guru or anybody. Every time I tried to, to be part of something, um, it would last for a while, but it was like a square peg in a round hole. And um, eventually I joined the army and I actually thought I found what I was looking for, like the song says. I served for nine years, but I, yeah, I served in Lebanon in 79. And the first night we landed there, we were ambushed and um, we were kind of pinned down for a while. My best mate with me was shot, he took three bullets. Uh, there was five or six guys shot in different areas in that night. You kind of train for that kind of thing, so you know you know how to deal with it. Or maybe you think you do. But that, when I came home, I started suffering from post-traumatic stress. And I had that for quite a few years, didn't know what it was. And being a soldier, like lots of soldiers, you don't express your emotions, you don't expect that, you express things. So I walked the dark road for a long time suicidal and all the all the stuff that comes with it. I often look back on that period of my life and wonder why I'm here. The journey is done in all different shamanic traditions uh, through you know ayahuasca or San Pedro or all different methods of journeying and in this Celtic tradition that I've learned we just we don't use any peripheral items we just use the journey itself so just taking the person through into a different uh, altered state if you look back on generations of um, indigenous peoples around the world in their villages there was they, they all had rituals for rites of passage and in those rites of passage it was about empowering people and that was that was done for generations so basically the rituals involved helping people to overcome their fears Chief Wananichi, he's Ojibwe tribe, and he said to me one time, we did a ceremony, and he said, in two minutes, he did whatever he had to. He said, the reason we do a very complicated ceremony, he said, sometimes, is to confuse the white man, to teach, so that he doesn't know how simple the medicine is. Generations ago, there would have been um, rituals, ceremonies, to um, cut the cards between the parents and the children, so the parents let go of the children, and the children became empowered. Um, it doesn't happen anymore, so people don't grow up. A medicine man once said, hmm, many moons ago, our men became men at maybe 10 or 12. These days, we're lucky if they make it at 50, because they don't do the ceremonies anymore. And what he was talking about was people confronting 
they're shallow. Slaying the dragon. Going to the mountaintop, fasting for days and waiting for division. Going out into the desert, whatever, for days. Even Jesus did it. He'd done his vision quest and he met his shadow. The feminine would have a history of being repressed, particularly within countries like Ireland where we had um, the Roman Catholic Church um, repressing women, refusing to allow them to be an active part of the church and making them second-class citizens, basically. And a lot of the women back over the generations were very angry about this, but they still supported the church because it was the only spiritual vehicle they had to commune with, with, with God, so to speak. But Goddess was lost here a long time ago. Bridget, the Bridget's Wells, you know, all the ancient uh, traditions, all the, the sacred sites, a lot of them have churches built on top of them. I know in this country, through, through time, we lost everything. We lost, we lost our language, we lost our religion, we lost everything. So, because so, the Catholic Church came in and took it over. But what, what I seen very strong with the Native American was, they lost everything too, but they held on to their spirituality. The Maoris are down to us. What I can kind of see through the ceremonies with them is, is reminding us of who we are. You know, it's bringing back that, 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 that connection. <laughs> if man doesn't respect woman, well, he's not going to respect Mother Earth either. And it, it's once, once this is realised, you can trace back this brutalisation of the land and this treating the land as an object. And, and trace it back and see the similarities of the way women have been treated like objects. I see people like vessels that hold the energy. So you wanted to think of like Aladdin and the genie. Your essence, your soul is the genie and the lamp is your body. So some people come in as a paper bag and they, they, they grow and they become these amazing marble vases. So a dark night of the soul would be where you go through a transformation, where you don't recognize who you are where your container that holds the essence of you, let's say the Aladdin's lamp, it breaks because you've outgrown it. All you can feel is the pain of the breaking. All you can feel is the lostness because you don't recognize yourself. But then it starts to reform in a different shape that's always better, that's made of a different quality material, that's always stronger, that can hold more of you. And then one day you, you turn around and you go, oh, okay, this is me now, who am I? And to let go of your old ideas of who you were and to allow yourself to be the new you. People, when they're on a journey to self-awareness, what they're usually on a journey to in modern times is they want to be, to make themselves into this person who's different. They want to move along this journey and I'm going to become this more loving person or I'm going to become more compassionate or whatever it is, right? But in actual, the actual fact of it, in my experience and many others, is that the self-awareness journey is not a journey of enlightenment to some place. It's about revealing more of who you already are. It's a journey of acceptance of your own nature. And the more you accept your own nature, the more everybody else will accept it. In as much as we go into a persona, um, what happens is the reflection coming back is not a reflection that reflects our natural selves. It reflects this, you know, we want people to, you know, it's like the emperor's new clothes. We want people to reflect the person we're trying to portray. And that creates a disconnectedness because the whole thing becomes a game. And deep down in our heart, we know it's a game. I suppose part of it is around for people to do the work, they have to take responsibility. Because a lot of the times people will say, it's because of this person, or it's that, or this happened, or that. But they don't see where they are in it. Like, you have to take responsibility because we can only heal ourselves. We can't heal other people. We can't change other people. So then I met someone along the way and this person handed me a sheet on shamanism. And she said, I think you should do this. I'd never heard of shamanism. I didn't know what it was. 
But one night late, I was sitting in the sitting room at home and I just was flicking the channels. This program was on about the, the, um, the Shibibo shamans in, in Peru, them doing the ayahuasca ceremonies and doing, doing the medicine. And it really fascinated me. So eventually I went to Martin Duffy in Dunderry and I, I did the introductory course in shamanism. But when I heard the drum, I started crying. I knew I'd come home. I thought everything was sorted. But little did I know that was the start of the journey. That was only the gate opening. Tonight we'll have fire ceremony and tonight is, is, a, is summer solstice. And what actually happens in summer solstice is the veils between the worlds are thinnest. So it's easy to access into the spirit world. But what we, we, we try to do is uh, to connect the people with their ancestors that are still here and pass the ancestors over. One of the things we try to do on this fire, we ask people, some people may and some people won't, to bring something that's kind of precious to them. Not all very precious, you know what I mean, but something that they have a connection to. But to give it to someone that they don't know, to a stranger. And that's a little lesson in, in letting go. told a long time ago, when you put the seed into the ground, it's covered over with clay. It's in the darkness, it's all alone. So the plant has a choice, either to die or to push its way up. So when it pushes its way up, it gets up to the top of the ground, connects with the sun, and it grows into a beautiful flower and into full blossom. But then when the cycle ends, it dies and it goes back again. We do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But why we get disease and disconnect is because we don't allow that cycle. We're afraid of change. We're afraid of, of, of moving with the tide, moving with the flow, or moving with the thing. I carry this, what they call negative thought form around for a lot of my life, and it caused a massive amount of depression to me. Because I'm so visual, I, I created it. So I had a monkey on my back that was programmed into me. And um, every time I opened up in relationships to connect with somebody, this thing would come back and get me. That's why a lot of people come up to suicide, because they, they know something is wrong and they can't fix it. But they need a medicine man and instead they get somebody waving a prayer book or something at them, which just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It does for some people, but for the majority of people, it's an energetic process. It's where they need to be brought into a space where somebody can move them energetically and spiritually into a place of safety to grow from and to plant them in the, like a tree and they can just blossom them. Sometimes they were in jobs and one things, but we were afraid to leave because we don't care afford to pay the rent, this, that, and the other, and we're stuck in this kind of thing. So the next thing, a disconnection comes with us. We become what I call walking dead because we go in and do the job. Go home, in and do the job. But we're, we're soulless, we're lifeless. For me, shamanism isn't about taking medication. It's not necessarily about banging a drum under a full moon, like doing fire ceremony. That's part of it. For me, shamanism is being in stillness. People start to trust themselves more, you know, rather than looking to one central, you know, the church or for direction or to be led, that people are becoming more tuned into their own sovereignty, that they have it within themselves. I believe everybody has the healing ability within themselves. Sometimes people need some direction, some facilitation. A feeling of connection is a flow. It's a flow, it's a back and forth, that you're not alone, that you're not solitary. Connecting to Mother Earth, Mother Earth is always here. There's so many people in depression because they're not connected to Mother Earth. Because she, you know, the essence of the planet that we're on is pure love. And yes, she's hurting at the moment, and yes, there's lots of things going on. But if you were to zoom out and see the planet as a whole, you could see that the hurt is localized, and we could hurt our hand and still have love in our heart, just like Mother Earth can have love there. That real connection is where the space is safe, that this person can really connect with themselves. Um, I'm. I'm a facilitator in that, um, to be there, to hold a safe space, 
to, you know, to facilitate the healing. And the only way people should go to do, you know, people think about these medicines, they're asking the different medicines. They think that by doing it'll sort everything out for them. It doesn't, you know, it really, lots of people feel that they have to do these medicines. You don't have to do them at all. It's only if you're called to do the medicine, you do it. You don't have to go and pay for it somewhere. It's free. You just have to bring your mind into a place of harmony and regular practice of some form of stillness, meditation, whatever you want to do, mindfulness, whatever it is, it will, it will help you to tap into that source. And it's about getting out of the head into the heart. The way maybe we do it here in the, in the Western world was different, but when we went into it, it was all the same. And it is all the same. It's just a, with shamanism, I believe that as it traveled across the, the planet, the tools became different because the landscape became different, but the thing was the same. Yeah. All right. Is that okay?